Well, good morning, church. Good morning, church. How are we today? Man, I'm so glad to be over here. This is such an absolute privilege for me. I have the incredible honor of getting to serve at Celebrate in Sioux Falls, and I just love getting to do that, and I, that means I, I do that on Sunday, so I don't get to come over here very often. It's been about like two years since I've come over here, so I am just so excited that I get to be here, and I just want to tell you something. you got a really cool church. you also got a really amazing lead pastor and Pastor John. I just so appreciate him. I appreciate him giving me the opportunity to be here. And I just appreciate, uh, he was one of the first people I met when I first came to Sioux Falls and, and started doing things that celebrate. And he just really poured into me and did so many things in my life. And I have so much respect for him. Also, I just think he's a man of incredible wisdom. You can tell that in, by, just by talking to him, but also by the fact that, you know, this week it's supposed to get down to like zero degrees and he's in Florida. Yeah. <laughs> so, you see it in multiple ways. But he, he is just such an amazing guy, and I, I'm just so thankful. And I'll tell you this, I, I, I just coming from an outside perspective, if it's been a while since you've reached out to your lead pastor and written him a note or, or something to tell him how awesome he is, I mean, take him out to lunch, buy him a new car, just the little things, just to tell him, hey, I appreciate you, that is so important because what he does is so amazing. So I appreciate that, and I appreciate that I, I get to open up God's Word. Before we do that, if you join me in a word of prayer, I'd love it. Father, I'm so thankful for you, God. Over and over I see in my life a common theme, that I'm kind of an idiot and you're really smart. My words don't bring life, yours do. My, anything in and of me it can't change a person's life, can't transform people, but you can. So today I pray for your words today. Pray that as we open up your scripture today that we're, we're going to walk out of here looking a little bit more like you today, Father. You are so awesome, amazing, and incredible. We praise your name. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So y'all have been in this series looking at life's healing choices. Looking at the choices in life that you have to make if you want God to change you. And, and, and kind of walking through those each week. And those are based on the Beatitudes of the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is when Jesus is kind of on this mountaintop and he starts off kind of with these, what, what are eventually called the Beatitudes, but he's basically saying, you're blessed if you do this. You're blessed if you do this. And today we're going to look at the fifth one of those that says this, Blessed are those who, who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Matthew 5, 6. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Now this is a really nice verse. I like this verse. I'm going to talk about this a little bit today. It's a great verse, but... Here's a question. I, I'm sure a lot of you probably heard this growing up, maybe. Maybe you've seen it somewhere. It looks great cross-stitched on a pillow. My wife and I have them on a, on a little uh, decorative plate, which is kind of funny because it's hungry and thirsting on a plate. But I'll tell you something. Sometimes this verse feels a little bit harder to live out than it does to actually, than it does on paper. I mean, it sounds great, hunger and thirst for righteousness. I mean, I, I, but sometimes it feels like, wait, what does that even mean? Like, we say it all the time, but what does it even mean to do that? It's kind of like, there, there's people in my life who, say, who do this a lot with a lot of things. Where they, just, they say something without even really knowing what it means. Like, there's so many people in my life who come around and they go, man, if something's like not quite up to snuff, they go, you know, that's really below par. And that's something a few friends of mine, we joke about it, that, that those of us that play golf, it's so funny. Because like, if you play golf, below par is actually a good thing. You know, I said that to a boss one time. It didn't work out well. So in the same way, we talk about hungering and thirsting for righteousness a lot. But do we really understand what it means to hunger and thirst? See, Jesus is using this metaphor for a very specific reason. Because hunger is something that can change us. Well, what's the old Snickers commercial say? You're not you when you're... You're not you when you're hungry. What, what's the other thing? The, the, our parents always said to you, don't go to the grocery store when you're hungry. hungry. Come on, we all know the answer. Let's try it one more time. You don't go to the grocery store when you're hungry. There it is. You know, it, why not? Because you, you impulse buy. You make choices you wouldn't normally make. You're, you're not thinking the way you normally would. When you're hungry, you're not you. You're not the person you normally are. I mean, I, I went to the grocery store the other day hungry, and my wife's like, what'd you buy? I'm like, aisle seven. Like, you, just, you make choices you wouldn't normally get. In the same way, when you're hungry for God, when you have a hunger and thirst for His righteousness, you're not the you you've normally been. You're not the you you've been your whole life without God. You're something different. 
You make decisions you wouldn't normally make. Maybe you spend your money in a way you wouldn't normally spend it. Maybe you spend your time in a way you wouldn't have normally spent it. And that's, I think, why, why God uses this metaphor here, saying, calling for us to hunger and thirst for His righteousness, for Him. And that's awesome and amazing. And I want that in my life. But I don't know if you're ever someone like me who just doesn't always hunger and thirst for what God wants in His life. Like, you, you, you hear the verses and you want to do it, but sometimes the hunger and thirst in your life isn't for God. It's, it's for some other things. Maybe some things that aren't really beneficial or maybe things that are just downright harmful. I know I've had this over and over in my life, and if you feel the same way as me, there's some really good news. Because the thing is, when Jesus was preaching this, he wasn't preaching this with fire and brimstone. Matter of fact, he was preaching this knowing that he was going to go down and, and die on a cross for every single time that I messed this up. He knew that he was going to leave and send his spirit into me that was going to continue to shape me and mold me and make me look more and more like him. So there's some really, really good news. Maybe if you're someone who thinks, man, I don't, I don't really feel like I, I'm really getting this or I don't feel like God's really working in me. I want to tell you something today. God wants to work in you. He wants to continue to transform you. Romans 12.2 re- refers to this as a transformation by the renewing of my mind. And God's continuing to do this in me. He's continuing to put new hungers in me. Continuing to do things like, it's almost like if you've ever done a diet or something like that where you you start to eat healthier things in your life, when you first taste them, they don't taste quite right. They're not what you've normally had, but the more that you do them, there starts to build momentum in your life. And in the same way, we kind of see in our life, almost as if when we we look at our life, we kind of want our life to look like this, Right? when it comes to transformation in our life, when it comes to God working in our life, we kind of like, want our life to look like this, right? So we've got like our, our, our time here on earth. This is us getting older. This is like our spiritual health here, right? We, we kind of want it to look like this, just straight line going straight up. I mean, just the moment I say, God, you take my life, all of a sudden then as I get older, my life just goes, and I just turn into a spiritual Jedi like that. Anybody? Anybody want, want that in their life? Yeah, absolutely. How many have that in your life? Not, not me. Here, here's kind of what it looks like for me a lot of times. You know, you, you kind of got one of these. You know, you kind of, you know, you just kind of, you know, it's just, it, it, there's just a lot of, it's just everywhere. It, it's just, it's just all over the place. There's ups and there's downs. And, and the reality is that God's with us in all of them, but he's continuing to transform us. And, and that's why today we're, we're going to talk about some things that, that, building off of what we've talked about in this series. It's going to be a little bit of review of what you guys have talked about already, and then talking today about the transformation choice. Last week, you guys talked about the house cleaning choice. The house cleaning choice was where you say, listen, I've examined my life. i got stuff in my life that I don't like, so I'm going to confess it to God and other people. I'm going to bring it to them because I want to bring it out of the light because I want to change. I want to be all that God has for me, so I'm going to bring that forward. And that's by far the hardest choice. I know some people shared, shared some things in their life last week, and anytime you step forward and bring things out of the light, that is the absolute hardest choice. But today we're going to talk about the transformation choice, and it is the longest choice. It takes a long time for God to transform us, not necessarily because God's slow, but because people like me are slow. And, and so today we're, we're going to talk a little bit about this. We're going to talk about someone who really shows what it looks like to be transformed by God and how hard it can be to, to go along that journey and what it looks like to keep seeking Jesus. If you, if you want to turn, if you've got your Bibles, if you want to go to Genesis 32, otherwise we'll have it up on the screen as we go along today. We're going to be looking at Jacob. Now, I don't know how many of you know the story of Jacob, but we're going to kind of look at some phases in Jacob's life. Some phases in Jacob's life that led to some choices in Jacob's life, and they're the choices that we've already been talking about throughout this series. So when I talk about phases, I'm going to talk about some phases that he's going through as we talk through the story, and then I'm going to talk through those choices that he's making that's going to lead us to transformation today. So the, the, to start off with, just talking a little bit about Jacob. How many know the story of Jacob? Most people do. Well, I'm going to do a quick overview, and I'll be super, super quick. If I'm too fast, I apologize, but I'll just be real, real quick because Jacob has a pretty jam-packed life. So I'm going to, I'm going to kind of go from the beginning. So you guys know, you know, Father Abraham had many sons, right? So you guys remember that guy, Abraham, right? One person is there. Yeah, thanks for me. I like the little, yeah. Anyways. 
So Abraham had a son named Isaac. Isaac had a couple sons named Jacob and Esau. Jacob and Esau were twins. Something interesting there is Esau was coming out first, and Jacob saw that or, or felt that or whatever, and he, he grabbed onto his leg and tried to kind of pull him back in and, and kind of come out first. And so his mom saw that and thought, man, that was kind of, uh, kind of trying to get, game the system, trying to come out first. So she named him Jacob, which means deceiver, means manipulator. So, <coughs> excuse me, right off the bat, his mom names him this name, manipulator, deceiver. And back then, names were a really, really big deal. And it was a big deal in Jacob's life because for a really big portion of his life, that's what he was, a manipulator and a deceiver. His older brother, he liked what his older brother had. So he, he, uh, he did some things to get his, he actually deceived him. He actually was able to, to kind of do a switcheroo on him and steal his birthright from him. And then he was able to actually get his kind of a, a final blessing from their father before their father passed. He was able to steal that from him. So he's able to manipulate and deceive to get whatever he wants. And so there's some kind of some friction with his brother. And so naturally, now Jacob's not really the fighting type, and Esau was. If you read the story, Esau was this big, strong, burly dude. So Jacob did the smart thing in, in many of our eyes, and he ran away. So he went to go live with his uncle Laban. His uncle Laban has a couple hot daughters. He goes, hey, I like that one right there. Can we get married? He says, well, you're going to have to marry, work for seven years to get to marry her. And he does, and then they, they, Laban kind of pulls kind of the wool over his eyes, kind of does a switcheroo on him, and actually gets him to marry the wrong daughter. I don't know how that happens, but it happened. <laughs> and so he marries the wrong daughter, and then Laban says, well, actually, you know what, why don't you stick around and work for another seven years, and you can marry the other daughter. And so he ends up walking away with two daughters, and he, he walks away, which is interesting that Jacob got deceived. It's always interesting in, in life. I always find it so funny that the deceivers always seem to get deceived. The cheaters always seem to get cheated. People who lie always seem to get lied to. People who cause drama always seem to talk about how there's so much drama around them. Like, there's this whole thing in the Bible about reaping what you sow. And so Jacob kind of gets this in his life. Then he, he uh, decides to turn the tables on his uncle. And his, his uncle says, hey, or uh, he says, listen, um, you, all, all the sheep that I have, all the, all the flocks that I have, any of them that are spotted, any of them that are basically, they weren't the good looking ones, right? Kind of the, the ugly ones of the bunch. And so um, he, he says, you, you can take the ugly ducklings and I'll keep the rest. That'll be your payment for all these years of, of being here with me. And so Jacob finds a way to kind of manipulate the system and get a whole bunch of, just basically he takes an ugly stick and smacks his entire herd with it. Basically is what happens. He basically gets the entire majority of Laban's herd to be spotted and not that good looking, which means Jacob got to keep them. So now Jacob has basically turned the tables. He has a whole bunch of wealth, and there's some kind of some friction there with, with Laban's sons and with his father-in-law. And so now... Jacob kind of is realizing this tension, realizing this conflict, realizing there's maybe not the best place for him to be, for his safety and his family. So he takes off in the middle of the night. Now, I don't know how many grandparents would do this if their grandkids took off in the middle of the night, but Laban didn't like that, and he went after him with an army. And so they end up having this confrontation. And it, long story short, uh, Jacob goes on his way, but he decides maybe they're not going to come home for Christmas for, for a couple of years. So... <laughs> Little, little tension there. Really can't go back home there. So now he's going back to his old home. And this is where we're going to pick up the story. Because he knows that right there is his, his old nemesis, his brother Esau. And he's not sure what this relationship's going to look like. And, and so before we get into that, it's something kind of interesting about Jacob's life. It kind of reads like a soap opera. Like there's always some sort of drama going on in his life. There's always something not so great happening. It always seems like every chance you get, he has some sort of conflict. Some sort of conflict. Something with someone else. And today, the first phase that God uses when he's trying to transform you is conflict. Conflict can mean a lot of things. Conflict can, can mean, obviously, an interaction with someone else where, where there you're conflicting with someone, but it can also, conflict as a verb, can also just mean something that, that's clashing. Clashing with, 
the view that you had on the world, clashing with the ideas, the plans you had, the diagnosis that goes against what you planned, the, 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 the job that you didn't get that you really thought you were going to get, the marriage that's ending that you didn't think was going to end, it can also mean the conflict with other people. And sometimes there's conflict that, that happens outside of us. Sometimes there's conflict that we cause because we're stupid, or I am. I don't know about you, but that's me. And so... Here, so the, the first phase we're going to talk about today is conflict, this struggle with others. The reality is we all have these conflicts in our life. We all have things that, that have some sort of a, 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 a time that it's not what we want it to be, and that's, the reality is that's where transformation starts. God can only transform us into who he wants us to be if we break from the normal, Right? I mean, for us to look different, to look like his son, something different has to happen in our lives. And so often, God's going to use conflict to break something in our life so that we can come to him and have him fix it. And the reality is, God's been trying to do this in Jacob's life for a really, really long time. But Jacob loves to run. He loves to run from conflict. That, that's one of his main things he does. He's had conflict with his brother, his wife, his father-in-law, all these people. And every single time... He just keeps running. And we do this so well, don't we? Man, we always love to run from conflict, especially in my life. I see it so often that we, we just kind of, we find a, a new friendship, a new marriage, a new church, a new whatever, because it, it, rather than, than playing in the mud with people and going through the conflict, we just like to just, ah, I'll just run away. I'll just move on. And that's what Jacob likes to do. And here, as we pick up, Jacob already has some conflict going on with his father-in-law. It's not a good situation, so he can't go backwards. But now he's got to go forwards. And as he's going forwards, now he's meeting up with his brother. And he knows his brother's out there. Esau is, is somewhere out there. And so he sends a messenger out to say, hey, see how Esau's doing. Check on him, you know. And uh, he, the messenger comes back and he says, listen, Esau's really, he's coming to see you. He's actually really, uh, really riled up about it. He, he's excited to see you. He's got 400 of his friends problem is they're armed. So Jacob realizes, oh man, okay, so he's coming at me with an army. So he, his brother's coming, and it says there at the end of the verse that Jacob was terrified at the news. I would be too. This is about to be a really crazy episode of Jerry Springer. Like, it, it's about to be some family feud action going on here. And so now in this moment, he has a choice. Because the reality is that how we handle conflict in our life has a direct relationship to how God can transform us and what we're going to be hungering and thirsting for in our life. We always have two choices every time we have a conflict. Anytime something goes wrong in your life, you've got one of two options, and the choice that you choose is going to determine whether or not God can use you, whether or not God can transform you, whether or not God can change you. It comes down to a simple statement. It's either your way or it's Yahweh. It's either your way, the way you think, or the way God wants to do it. It's either looking at handling business your own self or letting God be the one who takes over. I like to say it this way, busting somebody upside the head or bowing your head in prayer. Like there's just moments where you just got to say, listen, am I going to take this into my own hands or am I going to let God do something incredible? And so in this moment, we come to the first choice that we talked about week one. Pastor John talked about this. It's called the reality choice. It's a, it's a, it's a pretty important step. And it comes out of Matthew 5, 3. It says, God blesses those who realize their need for him. The reality of choice says this. It says, I realize I'm not God. I admit that I'm powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and that my life is unmanageable. Another way of saying this is that people say all, all the time that God helps those who help themselves. The reality is God only helps those who know they can't help themselves. And that's where Jacob's at right now. And so Jacob's about to do something really, really cool. He's going to turn to God. And I'm going to, we're, we're, if, you're, if you're following along with me in your Bibles, Genesis 32, 9 through 11 is where this is at. He's going to pray to God, and I'm going to kind of skim through it a little bit. But basically Jacob prays, and he says, God of my grandfather and my, my father Isaac, you told me to return to my own land and to your relatives, and you promised me that I'll treat you kindly. I'm not worthy of all the unfailing love and faithfulness you've shown to me. When I left home and crossed the river, I owned nothing except the walking stick. Now my household fills two large camps. 
O Lord, please rescue me from the hand of my brother Esau. I'm afraid that he's coming to attack me along with my wives and children. But you promise me, I will surely treat you kindly, and I'll multiply your descendants until they become as numerous as the sands along the seashore, too many to count. That's a really good prayer. I mean, that, that's what you're supposed to do. I mean, when, when you have conflict in your life, you're supposed to turn to God and say, God, I'm not worthy. You are. You're awesome. You take care of this. You promise me, and I'm standing on your promises. And that's a great place to end the message. But thankfully, the Vikings don't play till later tonight, so I got some time. So, because I don't know about you, but there's some times in my life when I, I, I say, God, you know, I want you to, I want to turn it over to you, but it doesn't quite work out, and the problem is me. The problem is what I do. My actions don't quite match up. And so in this moment here, Jacob is, is, is saying all the right things, but then he kind of ha- has a, a unique moment. See, he turns right around, and he, he, continue, he, he submits to God, and he turns around and tries to do it in his own power. And Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 7. Verse 15, he calls this his flesh. He says, I keep doing what I don't want to do. I keep doing the things in my life that I don't want. And, and, and th- th- it's not God in me, but there's this, this flesh, this evil inside of me that keeps going the other way. And Jacob's about to, to walk a different direction here. So he just prayed to God and said, God, you're in control. I, I want you to take charge of this. And so he wakes up the next morning. By the way, can y'all, did I mess up my mic too much? Can y'all still hear me? I was kind of, there you go. Um, So he wakes up the next morning, and he goes and he selects some gifts to present to his brother. He's got some goats, some ewes, some rams, some Starbucks gift cards, some camels, some bulls, some male donkeys. There's just a whole whole list of things. Long story short, he goes through this whole list and comes down to the end, and it says this. It says, Jacob thought, I'll try to appease him by sending gifts ahead of me. When I see him in person, perhaps he'll be friendly to me. So the gifts were sent on ahead while Jacob himself spent the night in the camp. Now that's interesting. See, Jacob had just told God, God, you're in charge. I, I, you, you take control. I'm standing on your promises. And then he turns right around and he goes, you know what? I'll try to manipulate my brother. I'll try to bribe him. Let's just send him some gifts. That's the way he's always done it. That's what always made sense to Jacob. That if there's a big rock in front of me, I'm going to find a way to tunnel underneath it. I'm not the kind of guy that can go bust up a, you know, big, strong people, but I can find a way. I can manipulate them. I can cheat them. I, I'll, I'm going to find some way around this. And God's about to tell Jacob, no, you can't keep doing it your own way. I don't know how many of you have ever done this, where you try to lay something at the altar before God, and then you feel like you kind of put it in your backpack before you go home. I, I know so many times that I, I can have these moments where, where I, I, I say, God, you take control of, of my marriage. You're in charge, God. I want to be the husband you want me to be, God. And then all of a sudden that one thing gets said, and then I decide to handle it the way I always think that it was right in my mind, which never works out well. Or maybe you're in a situation with your boss where all of a sudden you've said, God, I'm going to turn them over to you. I'm going to be a light in my workplace. And then all of a sudden your boss does that one thing and you want to just run right back and start gossiping about him and tearing him down behind his back because that's what makes you feel good and makes you feel like you have some power. Whatever it is, it's so easy to do this. It's so easy to have these moments where we say, God, you're in charge, and then our actions are the exact opposite. Anybody else ever been there? Man, and this brings us to our second phase of Jacob's life. It's a crisis. See, because when what I say doesn't match up with what I do, that's a crisis. And Jacob's about to struggle with God a little bit. God's about to come into his life and kind of have a bit of a conversation. And the reason being is because of the song we just sang just a little bit ago, Reckless Love. We have a God that recklessly loves us so much that he's willing to have a WWE moment with Jacob and do a little pile drive on him to get him to understand, I have something so much better for your life. I have something so much greater for you. And so, here in this moment, it says in in, in verse 22, During the night, Jacob got up and took his wives and his servants' wives and his sons and crossed the the Jabbok River with them. After taking them to the other side, he sent over all of his possessions, which, by the way, if you want to have a moment with God, getting rid of all the other things you care about in life and sending them away and just having a moment you alone with God, that's an amazing thing. And so it says here, 
that this left Jacob all alone in the camp. And a man came and wrestled with him. Now we know from reading to the end that there's two things going on here. One, we know this is God. It's God's presence. But two, we also know this. We know something bigger than a wrestling match is going on here. So we can read it with those lens if we read to the end of the chapter. And so the man comes and wrestles with him until dawn began to break all night long. When the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of his socket. Now, what's God doing here? Is God in this moment where, you know, he got in there and he starts wrestling, goes, wow, this guy's really strong. I can't beat him. That wasn't it. See, what God was doing here was he was changing Jacob, and it was about to end in a final change, but in this moment, he's asking Jacob a question. See, he's saying, Jacob, your whole life you've run from stuff, your whole life you've found a way to manipulate the system, but right here in this moment, what are you going to do? Are you going to face me? Are you going to accept what I have for you? Are you going to be willing to fight all night and spend all night sweating and, and being here in, in my presence? Are, are you going to be willing to truly strive for this? Or are you going to do it the way you've always done it? Are you going to try to run away? And so, Je so God is testing Jacob in this, and he sees that Jacob's not going to quit. He's not going to give up. He knows in this moment, I've got nothing left. I've sent my family away. Hopefully they're safe. They might get killed tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen. I got nothing left, God. So God, I'm going to keep fighting. And that's what leads us to the, the hope choice that we've talked about. The hope choice says that I earnestly believe that God exists, that I matter to Him, that He has the power to help me recover in my life. And so that then moves on in the story to the next phase. We call it the commitment phase. This is where I commit to God's changes in my life. And so it says this, the man, God, says, Let me go, for it is dawn. And Jacob panted, I won't let you go unless you bless me. Now this is a significant moment, because up until this point in time, Jacob had always held on to things he shouldn't have been holding on to. He had always held on to things that didn't make sense for him to hold on to. He held on to his brother. He, he tried to hold on to what his brother had. He wanted that more than anything else. He tried to hold on to all these things in life. And now in this moment, he's holding on to God, and he's saying, God, I'm not letting go. You can count on me. God, I want you. I want more of your presence in my life. I'm done with the way I've always done it. I'm going to hold on to you. And so... In this moment, as he's holding on, this is his way of committing. This is his way of consciously choosing to commit his life and will to Christ's care and control. That's what's called the commitment choice. But then he moves on here. And this story is so cool. When we look at Romans 6.13. I'm going to actually go back here. Romans 6.13 says, Don't let any part of your body become a tool of wickedness to be used for sinning. Instead, give yourselves completely to God since you've been given a new life and use your whole body as a tool to do what is right for the glory of God. So in this moment, maybe some of you have done this, where you've committed to God, God, I want you in my life. We talked last week, what's next? Well, what's next is there's things in me that aren't good. There's things in me that aren't of God, and I need to turn them over. And so that's what's going to happen right here. It's kind of a weird statement here in, in this verse. It's kind of a weird part of this story, and if you, you can so easily miss it. But God here, he turns to Jacob and he says, hey, what's your name? That's kind of a weird statement for God to ask, isn't it? I mean, it's kind of like when you, you know, it's kind of like the, the person who said, why don't you ever see the, the headline, Psychic Wins Lottery? Like, if you're God, you know that, I, what his name is. You know his name is Jacob. Why would you ask that? Well, because we talked about earlier, Jacob's name had defined his entire life up until that point. Jacob's saying in this point, not just that he's not just asking for his name, he's asking for his identity. See, the, 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 the title of deceiver and manipulator, it defined Jacob's whole life. And so God's not just asking what's your name, he's asking, who are you? Who are you really? What's that title? What's that phrase that would describe your life? When you're not walking with Jesus, what's that name? Man, is it drunkard? Is it, is it anger? Is it pain? Is it hurt? Well, what, what's the thing that's defining your life right now without God? And so God asked him, what's your name? He says, my name is 
Jacob. And so in this moment, he, he's doing what we talked about last week, the house cleaning choice. He's, he's expressing his, his faults, and he's asking God to, to change him. But then finally, something really cool starts to happen. This is where the conversion happens. This is where he's getting a new identity. Then God says to Jacob, he says this, he says, your name will no longer be Jacob. Your name will no longer be deceiver. Your name will no longer be manipulator. Your name will no longer be defined by these things that that other people have spoken into your life. But in this moment, your name is going to be Israel. Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, I is because I saw God face to face. Now this is an incredible thing we don't want to miss. The Bible says, we talked about this, the first verse we talked about today was Matthew 5, 6. It says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's in this moment that, that through all these phases, through all this brokenness in his life, He's continued to to get broken to the point where he hungers and thirsts so much for God that he's willing to do anything. He won't let go of God. And so in that moment, God says, I'm going to give you a new identity. That's what the transformation choice is all about. It's where I voluntarily voluntarily submit to every change God wants to make in my life. And I humbly ask him to remove my character defects. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says it this way, that if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation, that the old is gone and the new is here. And so in this moment, Jacob gets a new name. And once again, this whole story is one of those that you can glance over so easy and miss the significance of what's going on here. Jacob's name becomes Israel, which some translations would call a prince with God. There's a couple different translations there. And so that's cool. I mean, he gets a cooler name. That's nice. But that's not all that's happening. God's not just giving him a cool name. God's giving him a new identity. He's saying, you're a new person now. You're going to be someone different. And what's really cool is if we read the rest of the story, Israel's life becomes really, really cool. I mean, he has some sons. You guys may know the 12 tribes. He's got